How many of you believe in Jesus here? Say amen. 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 Jesus said, Blessed are you amen. who have not seen him yet believe. You have not seen him. I have not seen him. Mm -hmm. But we believe. And we have the promise that we are blessed. Amen. 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 You see, Thomas was always known as the doubting apostle. But Thomas wasn't the only one to doubt Jesus, his resurrection. Every one of them, they all doubted it. So why was Thomas branded as the doubter? And what difference can that make to us? That, in a nutshell, is what we're going to talk about this evening. John chapter 20, verse 24 to 31. Now, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, this is Thomas saying, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. Mm -hmm. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. You know, I could just preach on just that Jesus came and the doors being shut. No matter what kind of hiding you do, it doesn't matter. He'll show up right there. You can't hoodwink him at all. He'll show up. But today's topic is different. We'll go there. And stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, in Greek it says, O curious move, O teos move. My Lord and my God. O kurios, kurios is the Lord. And o teos, teos is the Greek word for God. My Lord and my God. He never actually did put his finger in Jesus' hands or his side. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And you confess you have not seen him, but you believe him. So blessed are you, hallelujah. Amen. You're in the company of blessed people. Amen. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. The Bible is not enough to write all the things that Jesus did. But then it says in verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. There's only life in his name. There's no life outside of his name. Several years ago, two friends went to, uh, for, and they went out for a drive in the country. Walter was sharing his dream with his friend Art. As they drove off the main road, through a grove of trees, to a large expanse of the land, Walter said he had a dream for what he could do with the land. And that he had planned to develop a family attraction there. But that venture would use all of his money. And so he told Mark, his friend, um, you know, that the land on which they were standing bordered the proposed building site. And he asked Art if he would consider buying up all of the adjacent land to build restaurants and hotels because the land values would soar in just a matter of time. Art's only response was doubt and disbelief. He told Walter that he was crazy. Why would anybody drive for miles from the city to the middle of nowhere? There was no way he was going to spend money on a crazy dream like that. And that was how Art Linkletter, a prominent TV personality of that day, turned down Walt Disney, when he was when he offered the opportunity to buy up all the land that surrounded what now became known as Disneyland. <laughs> Doubt cost Art Linkletter a fortune. A 
And the Bible warns each one of us that we have to be careful because doubt can cost us a great deal as well. You see, you wonder why, why it didn't happen. You know, and people say, I knew it wasn't going to happen. You already know that it's not going to happen. There's that doubt that just says, there's, there's a knowing. The Bible says in John, James chapter 1, verse 5 and 8, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no what? Yeah. Doubting. Because we doubt, we go, I don't know if God's going to do it. I, I don't think he's going to do it. You know, there's kind of doubt. For the one who doubts, the Bible says, is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Think of your lifestyle when you don't trust in God, when you have doubts whether he will deliver. You know, you're like the waves of the sea that's being tossed back and forth, not knowing what will happen or how it will happen. You know, you're just like that. That's what the Bible says. For that person must not suppose, this is also what the Bible says, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. If you have doubt, it says, don't suppose you're going to get anything from the Lord. Because he says he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Because God said he will do it, you just have no doubt. He'll deliver. And so saying, oh man, I don't know. You see, doubt can be a dangerous thing in a Christian's life. And that brings us to the disciple we're talking about this evening. The disciple that everyone knows as Doubting Thomas. I'm not sure when they started uh, calling him Doubting Thomas. But one source noted that it was as early as the 6th century that artwork began to portray him, uh, what began, uh, what became known as uh, you know, Doubting Thomas. They, 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 they drew a lot of things and, and portrayed him as the one who doubted. Now recently, there have been those who, who thought this labeling of doubt has been unfair to Thomas. One person said, in the end, the nickname Doubting Thomas is a rather, it's rather an unfortunate one. You know, it's true that Thomas demanded evidence of the miracle of Christ's resurrection before he accepted the truth. That's the truth. Doubt factored into his response to his friends but it was not the defining quality of his life. Right. right. Thomas should be better known for his loyalty, for his obedience to the gospel and his faith, because he's demonstrated a lot of that. In other words, cut Thomas some slack. Mm -hmm. He actually did accept the truth uh, of the resurrection after doubting for a bit, and he wasn't all really, I mean, really that bad of a guy. Now, others have rightly pointed out that Thomas wasn't the only one who doubted Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Right. Because if you read the Bible, when the women reported to the disciples, the apostles, that Jesus had risen, the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verse 10 to 11, this is what the Bible says. Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other woman, with them, who told these things to the apostles, they, they went ahead and told them, hey, Jesus read. But these words, the Bible says, seem to them, the word it uses, an, an idle tale. And they did not believe them. <coughs> so these women went up there and they said, hey, Jesus has risen. They're excited. They're saying, hey, you know, this finally happened. And they're like, yeah, right. All of the apostles. And the Bible also says in Luke chapter 24, verse 36 to 40. I'll ask Bradley to put that up a little bit. <coughs> in that verse, the Bible says Jesus himself stood among the disciples. He came there and said, peace to you. But the Bible says they were startled and frightened. And they thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you so troubled? Why so many doubts arise in your hearts? I thought, you know, if Jesus showed up in our church, it says he's in our midst, if he manifested himself, how many today 
will believe that's him. You know, well, you have no doubt, because he'll show up in all his power. But this is what it says, why are you so troubled? He says, why are you so troubled? And why all these doubts that arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. That's what Jesus said. He says, for the spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see, that I have. He's got flesh and bones. And when he said this, he showed, his, showed them his hands and his feet. So none of the apostles believed Jesus came to them. He said, touch my hands, touch my feet. Look, I'm here. I'm not a spirit like you're thinking about. And you, because you can't see it. The spirit doesn't have flesh and blood. I'm the son of God. Take a look. Really? I thought only Thomas had to use, see the hands and feet of Jesus to be human. But here in the book of Luke, it says all the disciples needed to see the nail prints to help with their doubt. Thomas was not the only one who doubted. They all did. We do too. Why did Thomas get so much attention about this though? That's the question. Well, I think it was because he deserved the attention. I don't think it was because of his doubt as much as how he expressed his doubt. Yeah. I believe it was because of how he expressed because he, he deserved a, because of that he deserved that label doubting Thomas. But before we get to that, we need to realize that Thomas and the rest of the disciples should have known that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. Why? Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to 22, it says this. Now this was after Peter made the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus began to show them, the Bible says. Amen. He showed to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes Amen. and be killed and, and on, on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Again, the Bible says in Mark chapter 9, verse 31 to 32, it says, He was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Again, and, and in Luke chapter 18, these three references, Luke chapter 18, verse 31 to 34, Jesus says the same thing. He said, Take the twelve, and he said to them, See, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit on and after flogging him, they will kill him and on the third day he will rise. Time after time, Jesus drove home the fact that he would die, but after three days, he would rise from the dead. He told them over and over again. But what's interesting about, about all, all of the three passages is that well, that we just uh, looked at, the disciples are described as struggling to understand what Jesus had said. Just as we struggle to understand so many elements of our life in the practical sense, we go, I don't know if, if God can do this. I don't know if God will do this. You know, you know in your head what it is. You know in your heart. But when it comes to the practical application of that faith, we struggle. You and I struggle because the apostles struggle and, and we're all the same. The Bible talks about it. In the, in the Bible chapter of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus told them that he would be killed and rise from the dead. And Peter took him aside uh, and began to, to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. You see, Peter, he caught the part where Jesus would die. He understood that part really well. But not the part where he said he would rise from the dead. He listened to all of that. Oh, you're gonna, they're going to kill him. No, let's not go to Jerusalem. His solution was, if we go to Jerusalem, you're going to get killed. Let us not do that. In the Bible references of Mark chapter 9 and, and Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells the disciples that he would be killed and rise from the dead. And then the Bible says, because, uh, oh, you know, we don't know what they understood about you might say, but the Bible says this. It says, but they did not understand. <laughs> they didn't understand the same and, and were afraid to ask him as well as well. Oh, man, what does he mean right from the dead? I don't know what he's talking about. Let's just not go to Jerusalem. That was a plan. It was like they heard what he said, but could not connect the dots. It's like we are the same. We hear what he says. He says, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of Egypt. He tells us, I am God who gave you, I provided for you, I took care of you. I was there before you were born, before you were knit together in your mother's womb. I know all about your life. Mama. Trust me. 
Oh, yeah. yeah, but this dot and that dot, we can't seem to be connected. He was telling those people who are in the wilderness for 40 years, trust me, you've been eating, you've been drinking water, you've been watching, you've been taking care, you've been taking care of, will you trust me now? They still couldn't do it. That entire generation was killed because they couldn't get that one simple aspect of not doubting the Lord God Almighty and listening to Him and trusting Him. They couldn't do it. The apostles couldn't. They didn't understand. Jesus was telling them in person. At least that one you could say they came through Moses and, they got, and you could say, well, maybe the message got changed. But here's Jesus telling his apostles. It was like they heard what he said, but could not connect the dots. They heard that he was going to die, but not that, not that he was going to rise from the dead. That part they didn't hear at all. I mean, that is what Thomas heard as well. When Jesus told his disciples, that he was going to Lazarus' home, even. Lazarus had been dead and buried. Thomas sensed the danger of going so close to Jerusalem because Jesus often talked about when he went to Jerusalem, this is what they're going to do to him. Where the leaders wanted to kill Jesus. And where was Lazarus? In the Jerusalem area. Thomas already knows what Jesus was saying about going there and getting killed. In John chapter 11, verse 16, Thomas responds like this when Jesus is going to Lazarus' death. He says, let us also go that we may die with him. Because he, he knows if Jesus is going to get killed, we're going to get killed. But his loyalty, I want to point that out, his loyalty, he says, let's go. We're going to die with him, but that's all right, let's go. Now he definitely understood that Jesus would die but not that he would rise from the dead. None of his disciples believed Jesus would rise from the dead either. It was not just Thomas that doubted that Jesus would rise from the dead. They all doubted that. And the question is, why? Why only label Thomas as a quote-unquote doubter when everybody else, everybody doubted? In my mind, it wasn't because of his doubt. It was because of what he said. In John chapter 20, verse 25, Thomas says, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. That's Thomas, quote unquote, Thomas said that. None of these other disciples said anything like that at all. They all doubted, but none of them were as brazen to say, I don't believe. But Thomas did. He said, I, I will never believe till I, I see it for myself. And some of us have, are capable of or are there already. Like, this Christianity thing is all great, but I don't really think it's going to work out for me the way they're making it sound. You see, there's a story about the Peter walking on water. It took a tremendous act of faith on his part. No one else on earth walked on water, Peter did. But we're told that he began to sink because he saw the wind and the waves. The Bible says in Mark chapter 14, verse 31, it says, And as Jesus reached his hand to Peter to pull him up out of the water, he asked, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you keep down? There's that word again. He says, You were doing great, but why did you doubt? When I read that, I wondered, why do people doubt? I mean, I, I came to the conclusion there are at least two reasons. In all of our outreach, this is what I've heard. So maybe you know more reasons, but I'll just be brief and talk to you about two reasons. First, they refuse to believe. I mean, what do I mean by the thing they refuse to believe? They consciously decided not to believe. There are those. That's the first reason. They say, I, I, I don't tell me. They say, don't tell me. I don't believe all that stuff. There are people who refuse to really believe because they have sin in their lives. Years ago, there was a married man who was a, a prominent member in a church. One day, he came to his pastor and told him of his doubts he, he was having about the Bible. He said, there seem to be a number of errors in the scriptures. He said, there's a lot of mistakes in the Bible. The pastor tried to explain to him that they weren't really mis errors, but the other guy wasn't willing to listen. He was convinced that he could not trust the Bible 
and thus he doubted God. Eventually he stopped coming to, <coughs> coming to church. Next, he divorced his wife and went off to live with another woman he had been committing adultery with all during that time. The pastor said that he realized as to why the guy refused to believe in the trustworthiness of his Bible. You see, if he accepted the Bible as the unquestionable word of God, he would have to change his life. If the Bible is true, your life has to change. No doubt about it. That's ever, everybody. That's what repentance is all about. He would have spent, he would, this person had to have to repent of his sin. He would, he would have to leave the woman he was sinning with and change his ways. And so he chose to refuse to trust God. He refused to believe and he let doubt take over. That way, he didn't have to change his lifestyle. Secondly, people refuse to believe because they trust in something more than God. They doubt because their friends say, you know, there's a lot of influence in friends. The friends say, hey man, God can't do that kind of thing. God cannot do certain things. They doubt because, or, or this is another very, uh, you know, uh, percentage-wise, more people point out to this reason. They doubt because science says God cannot do certain things. There's a famous, uh, fairly famous Christian speaker who comes across as intelligent, uh, easy to understand, very eloquent, but it was shocking to hear him say that he refused to believe in a certain miracle in scripture that Jesus did because he said that that particular miracle defied the laws of physics. <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. I said there are at least three problems with the statement. The First, he was saying that science slash physics has a greater authority for him than God in his word. You know, we could stop all of the scientists right there, you know, who point out, well, science says this. We can tell them science <laughs> and physics and whatever else is not the greater authority. God and his word is the greater authority. Mm -hmm. So that stands, you know, about all of the stuff that we can claim as science. So this person was saying science slash physics has a greater authority for him than God's word. And secondly, he ignored the fact that every miracle in the Bible defies the laws of physics. I mean, <laughs> including the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I'm sure that people rising from the dead after several days in the grave violates some law of physics. And so this man doubted because he trusted science more than God. Thirdly, people refuse to believe because they personally believe in a small God. Their God fits in a small box. They don't let him out, you know. They don't believe he can do much because he has to fit in that small box. You know, this is what my God can do. Their God cannot do many miracles. Their God cannot protect, you know, his word. Their God cannot intervene on behalf of his people. These folks have a little God who lives in a little box. They doubt God because they don't think he can do anything to begin with. And that's exactly, you know, was Thomas's problem to begin with. His God was too small to raise Jesus from the dead. So Thomas refused to believe. He doubted because he served a little God. By contrast, there are people who have a big God. He speaks and it's time. He commands, and it happens. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of each and every one that fear him. Amen. You see, people with the, with the big God are not crippled with doubts because their God is too big for them. You say, well, uh, you pray to God and say, I don't know if God can do that. No, your God is not a small God. And so many people, you see, many people doubt God because they have already decided to refuse to believe. They are uh, not going to believe. They already decided that. Either because of their sin or they trust something more than they trust God and His Word. Science, for example. All because they believe in a small God who lives in a small box. <laughs> and those choices can be dangerous. They can rob folks of blessings they would have had otherwise. Someone said this, and I, and I think this was pretty great. He said, pray, believe, and receive, or pray, doubt, and do without. 
If you doubt, you're going to do that and you wonder why, you know, I prayed nothing happened because you doubt it. But what about the rest of us? You know, that's what I want to ask the question. The question is, what about the rest of us? What about those of us who would never think of refusing to believe God? You know what I mean? I don't, I don't, uh, I believe God. You know, if you ask each and every one of us, you say, yeah, I believe God. But what about those who still struggle with doubts? In your heart of hearts, certain things you doubt, you know, man, I don't know. You may use some theological way or, or Christianish, professional Christianish way of explaining it, you know, well, I'm not sure it's in the will of God. Or I'm not sure, you know, theologically, if it's acceptable to God, I just don't know. Whatever it is, those of us who struggle with doubts, consider the story of Peter walking on the water. Jesus rebuked him for his doubt. Why did Peter doubt? Amen. Not because he refused to believe. Jesus didn't say, oh man, how do you refuse to believe? No. Oh. But because he took his eyes off of Jesus. It's when he quit looking at Jesus. That he began, you know, looking at the wind and the waves. And that's what happened in our lives. When we look, focus more on the issues and the problems of our lives. Because they can be so overwhelming. He's in the middle of a storm. He's on the wave. He's not tied to a boat anymore. There's nothing safe. He's standing there on water. And his attention is going to take off to the other things than Jesus. And that's how life is. As you go, you know, many things are going to hit you. This and that and that. And some are more overwhelming to you than others. And every time they overwhelm you, you know, instead of looking, keeping your eyes on Jesus, you look around at the other things and you wonder what's happening. When he quit looking at Jesus, that he, and he began looking at the wind and the waves, it was then that he began to doubt and fear. And when his, that's when his faith died in him. He began to sink beneath the waves now. What that tells me is this. There's a way to protect myself against doubt and fear. There is a way. What's the way? I need to focus on Jesus. If I want to have a strong faith that isn't crippled by doubt or fear, both those things are very strong motivation factors in my life. If my faith should be, uh, shouldn't be crippled by doubt and fear, I need to keep my eyes on Jesus, no matter how strong the wind or the waves are. And that's what has changed things, you know, you know, you know even for Thomas. His doubt turned to faith. He said, he looked at Jesus. This is what's happening. You see, when he looked at Jesus, Thomas declared this. In the Greek it says, O kurios mu, o teos mu, my Lord. Yeah, touch it. He said, you want to touch it? Touch it. And then you'll believe, right? Jesus said, he said, no, I don't want it. Now his words, he said, oh, curios mo, oteos mo, my Lord and my God. The Bible says in Mark chapter 9, verse 22 to 24. This is the father that comes to Jesus, asking him to heal his son. And he says to Jesus, this is his saying. This father is telling Jesus this. He's saying to Jesus, if you can do this, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus left the whole thing out and he says, if you can, <laughs> what do you mean if you can? He says, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child who wanted, you know, God to heal his son. Praise Jesus and immediately it says the father of the child cried out and said, I believe you, Lord, please help my unbelief. He doubted. He said, if you can, have compassion. Jesus said, what do you mean, if you can? You don't know, you know, with God all things are possible. Watch what I do. But uh, Jesus healed that son of that father. Right. Why would Jesus heal this boy? The father obviously had doubts. He admitted it. Help my unbelief, he said. He had unbelief in Jesus. So why would Jesus heal the body even with his unbelief? In fact, in another part of the gospel, we're told that Jesus is in one town and Jesus did not do many miracles because of their unbelief in that town. They did not believe him. They had unbelief. This father had unbelief. That town had unbelief. 